Welcome to the Mobile Hunters Dojo. Take a seat on the mat and get ready to learn from today's best mobile hunting masters. I'm your host, the White Belt Sensei, Matt Lear. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at the Mobile Hunters Dojo. All right, everybody, welcome back to the dojo. Kick off your shoes and take a seat on the mat. We are here with um, Tim Smoke. And Tim, I saw your video or videos on Instagram, and I immediately thought to myself, like, there's a guy who knows how to teach. Like, you had like a heart for teaching, and um, you had a really good way of explaining your stuff. And um, and that was like, man, I got to say that's probably six months ago. And I knew even back then I was thinking about doing the podcast and I knew right away that you were a guy that I wanted to have on. And then we've gotten to share a little bit of information. I've got to learn more about you. And um, that really solidified for me that I had to have you on the show. So I want to thank, thank you for coming on and welcome to the dojo, man. I appreciate it. I'm really excited. And uh, yeah, I, I love to teach, but I also love to learn. So this is kind of great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, likewise, I, it's a, it's a two way street always. So um, so why don't you give the listeners a little bit of a background so they kind of know who you are and, and what you're about? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, Tim smoke and, uh, I'm, I'm almost 50, I'll be 50 in July. So I'm, I'm trying to fight that off, but, uh, originally, uh, born and raised, uh, in the Southern area of Michigan. Um, my parents actually got a uh, divorce when I was really young. So I always joke that, you know, I lived in the city by the week and in the country on the weekends. So, um, my, uh, dad's side of the family had a 120 acre farm out in Lapeer County in the thumb area. So that's where I kind of learned how to, uh, you know, chase, uh, white tails and squirrels and pheasant. Um, but, uh, so I spent my first 18 years there. And then, um, after high school, I wasn't really committed to, uh, higher education. I tried my uh, hand at community college and quickly realized that I wasn't ready for that. So uh, I decided to uh, join the army thinking I'd just do a few years and get back out and go back to college. Well, 24 and a half years later, I decided it was time to get out of the army. So I did a full career in the army. Um, and then uh, when I retired, which was around 2000, late 2016, my last duty assignment was here in Kentucky and my wife's a Louisville native. Ah. So we decided to, uh, you know, stay home. And uh, so I, I made uh, Kentucky my home since I've lived here since 2012. And uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's been a, it's been a good career. So once I retired, I decided that um, instead of doing like what a lot of retirees do and try to go back into the government service, I said, I'm done with the government altogether. And I found myself in uh, non for profit. And so now I'm the director of risk management for one of the largest non for profits in Kentucky. So that's what wow. I'm currently. That's awesome. So we have some things in common. First, I want to say thank you for your service. Sincerely. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for that. And then the other thing is that my mom is, was born in Louisville. Okay. And, yeah. And um, so like their whole family's from there and we have real Kentucky fried chicken and, and uh, which will kill you. It'll give you a heart attack. They, <laughs> That's true. She, she, tur she turns the grease into gravy and yep. then like, it's just amazing. And my, my grandmother used to, they probably don't, talk like this anymore down there but my grandmother used to make me shit on a shingle and it was yeah they do yeah do they? yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm familiar with all of that and then the other part is we both come from nonprofit. so um prior to doing what i'm doing now um i worked in nonprofit for since 2008 i believe so um it's been a long time so yeah we have some things in common man i appreciate that that's awesome yeah and i just loved actually when i retired from the army I went into for-profit, uh, I went to a manufacturing environment. Um, when, before I retired from the Army, I knew that I needed to do something else education-wise. I had a bachelor's in criminal justice, but I knew I did not want to be in law enforcement. So I was like, well, what is it else I can do? So I landed on going back to get my master's in occupational safety and health. Yeah. So when I got out of the army, I went to be a safety professional in manufacturing uh, environment for about two years. And although I learned a lot and there were some great people I worked with, I just hated the for-profit sector. I just felt mm -hmm. like, you know, it was just a greedy corporation trying to work workers to death, you know, and to make maximum profits. 
So when the opportunity uh, presented itself to go for the non-for-profit, um, that was five years ago. I just hit my five-year anniversary um, last month. And I'll tell you what, I've loved every second of it. Yeah. So, I'm, yeah. Mission focus, man. I mean, that it makes exactly. the world of a difference. Yep. yep. Yeah. So um, along the lines of mission, like one of the missions of, of the dojo is to, I guess, you know, help people along at any level where they're at, help them develop to their fullest potential as a hunter. And actually beyond that, because I really think like the stuff that makes a great hunter when applied to the rest of their life actually makes a great human being. And and that's why I'm excited about doing this podcast is because what we're going to talk about today, I, I truly feel is the, the it is really the um, dividing factor between a great hunter and and someone who's not maybe, you know, and, and it's not tactics. First of all, so I'll let everybody know that we're not talking tactics. And I think you can go and try to learn all the tactics you want. But if your mindset is not in the right place, then um, it's not going to it's not going to work for you. And if it does, it's going to be an empty trophy um, because it's it's the mindset and the discipline um, in the process that I think really refines the person and the hunter. And so um, I, I one thing I noticed about your videos right away is I looked at you and I was like, okay, first of all, high quality videos. I mean, real high quality. <laughs> your, your, your stuff is well organized. Your gear is well organized. Like, you know what you're talking about. And I immediately was like, okay, there's this guy has discipline in his life. So uh, I reached out to you and said, hey, what do you think about talking about that? And one, that was a little bit of like you were kind of sharing kind of your philosophy in life. And I'm like, hey, can we talk about this? And you're like, yeah, let's do it, man. So if we can dive totally. into that, yeah. Can you kind of talk about, um, I guess, the role of discipline and how it, it it plays out in your career as a hunter? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I get the benefit of discipline being instilled in me for, you know, my entire military career, right? So let's think about it. When you're joining the military, the first thing your drill sergeant's doing is having you do the most menial tasks, but to a certain standard. And you're thinking like, why does it matter that the corners on my bed are at a 45 degrees? Like that's, who cares? But it's the little things that add up to the big things. And that kind of just carries on throughout your career and throughout your life. So the discipline aspect um, just means that you know, even if you're having a bad day or you don't feel like doing something, you do it anyway because you know that's the right thing to do, right? And I think that really translates to the hunting world because, you know, let's let's think about it. One, lots of early mornings involved, right? Um, depending on what kind of hunter you are, um, I'll be upfront honest. I'm 90% of the time I'm hunting public land, big woods, hill country, no ag. So completely big woods, hills, um, so you're, you're usually putting in some miles going back where, you know, other hunters aren't that requires discipline, because if you don't have that discipline, it's going to be really easy to stop at that first rub line or scrape line. That's, you know, hundred, 200 meters from the truck. He's like, oh, this is good enough. Right. Yeah. So, um, so discipline just carries over into that aspect of our lives, which we know if, if anybody's listening to this podcast, they're a diehard hunter, right? Because mm -hmm. if they're not listening to podcasts, they're probably just the weekend warrior and get out there and grab the rifle for a couple of days a year. And that's it. So the folks we're talking to are the ones that are really trying to up their game to that next level. Um, and discipline also entails your physical preparation for okay, yeah. not only hunting, but just life in general. And you and I were talking a little bit about this before we started um, the podcast tonight that, you know, being in good physical, mental, spiritual health leads to so many more positive things, whether it's hunting related, whether it's personal, whether it's professional, um, because if you are um, confident the likelihood of you being successful is exponentially higher than if you're going into a situation where you're doubting yourself. Mm -hmm. So how many of us have gone out on a hunt, like an evening hunt, and like, this is good enough. I'm probably not going to see a deer and you like, you're going in there with no confidence at all. And a lot of times that translates to seeing no or little deer movement. Um, but when you go to a spot where you're like, you've done your homework, 
you know, you have trail camera pictures confirming that there's deer using that area. The weather's right, you know, high pressure, you know, and you go in there and you're like, I'm going to, if I don't kill a deer tonight, I'm going to see a deer that I would want to kill. And most likely you're going to have higher odds of seeing things. So, you know, that discipline translates into having and creating opportunities for yourself. So that's really what discipline to me means, you know, and let's face it, we all have lives outside of hunting, right? So I personally um, have a lot going on in my family life, right? I was just telling you, we just had granddaughter number two this past Wednesday. I have a three-year-old granddaughter um, and they're the loves of my life and they want to spend a lot of time with me. So my time in the woods is really dictated by when they don't want to be with Papa, right? So um, I feel bad when I go into a situation where I didn't capitalize on it. I spent time away from family. I'm out there. I, don't get me wrong. I love hunting. You know, we all eat, breathe, and sleep it, and we want to be out there as much as possible. But we don't. We're not out there for just the kicks of it. We want to go out there and be successful. So when you let an opportunity slip through your fingers because of something you did or didn't do you know, like, okay, I'm not going to do that again. So that comes to that discipline aspect and being really good at dissecting and being self-aware of what it is that you did to cause the failure. Right. And I have a really good um, example of that that happened to me in 2023. And, you know, it's funny listening to your podcast and listening to some other podcasts. It really seems like 2023 was the struggle bus year for mm-hmm. a lot of hunters. Yeah. And it wasn't necessarily because we didn't put ourselves in the right place at the right time. Um, a lot of it, I think, had to do with, you know, the overabundance of acorns, you know, and all the other factors that come into play, you know, and it's just like deer have a vote, right? We obviously we're, we're the apex predator. We're smarter than deer, but deer live in those woods, you know, 365, 24, seven, they know those woods, like, you know, we know our living room and yeah. they have the advantage. So But yeah, it's, it's a, it's a disciplined mindset that is going to get you to that next level. And if you don't have discipline now, um, then you can create it, but there's some things we're going to talk about that can possibly make, take your game to the next level. So, yeah, for sure. In part, there's a couple of things you said I want to go back and touch on, but one thing I'll say is that, um, part of discipline is delayed gratification as well. And so some of the, the mistakes that I made as um, a younger hunter and I mean, kind of carried with me for a long time until I got free of it. Probably, I mean, I want to say at least a decade. I'm a slow learner. Um, was this idea that I got to get it done now. And which meant I wasn't investing into next year's hunt or, or the year after hunt. I, the, the data I was collecting was meant for right now because I have to kill right now because everybody else that I'm seeing is killing right now. And I got to get up there with them right away. I wanted to jump over, you know, all of the learning lessons to get right to killing big deer. And what that happened is actually slowed my, my progression because I was always focused in the here and now. And it meant I really didn't set myself up for success. And if you want to like, it would be equivalent to saying, Hey, instead of working up to the 225 pound bench, you know, uh, I'm going to jump right to it. My first time I ever b- bench press, I'm going to throw in the 225 and see how I go, you know, right. not gonna, probably gonna, not going to go well for me. You know, I'm probably going to yeah. hurt myself and not be able to work out. So, but that's what I was doing. I was constantly hurting myself because I wanted the satisfaction of today. Um, and I, I never found that satisfaction. So I, we'll talk about that too. But a couple of things that you said, I think is crucial. You were talking about critical feedback, being honest about yourself, like going, okay, what, what happened in this hunt that, what did I do that caused this not to go the way I wanted it to go? And I think, and I, if I, I'll get on a little bit of a soapbox real quick. I think some of the, the problem with, um, things, how they're going in the world today is that, that fear of actually facing critical feedback, like being honest with yourself or even speaking it from other people. You know, and, and asking sincerely, like, hey, man, what am I missing here? What am I not doing well? And and that could if if we can learn that skill of of seeking critical feedback, being self-aware and giving ourselves critical critical feedback, we'll yeah. progress as a hunter. We'll progress as all the other roles that you play in your life, you know, a, a son, a, a father, a husband, whatever it is, an employee. 
you know, it, it'll just increase your quality of life all the way around. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah. And that is a solid point. And we were talking about this a little bit earlier too. And, you know, and I think part of my success over the last 10 years, and I will say that I really started putting the pieces of the puzzle together and really started becoming a more of a consistent killer um, in 2014. So I, I did some math and I've, since 2014, I've killed 19 bucks. Um, and I have the stats right here. Um, all 19 were over 120 inches, but of an, of those 19, four were over 150, one over 160 and five over 140. And, you know, and I'm not saying that to brag, but what I'm saying is, is that I've been hunting since 1986 and that's, you know, do the math, right? So that's yeah. what, almost 40 years or 30 six years, something like that. Anyway, so a long time. And I didn't really, I was a late learner, right? Because and I, there's some excuses in there. I could say, you know, when I joined the army and then 9-11 happened and I ended up deploying, you know, I was deployed five times. So I was gone a lot of training when I wasn't deployed. So I really couldn't focus on the hunting aspect for a, a a large majority of the time I was in the army. So once I got closer to retirement and I could reshift focus back to that and then being a little bit more mature and being surrounded by some big buck killers and just really absorbing their knowledge and to your point, accepting the critical feedback. And I'll tell you, one of my best friends today, uh, his name's Aaron. Um, he and I have been friends for about 26 years. We're all old army buddies. And the one thing I love and despise about him, and I hopefully he'll listen to this and, you know, he'll get a kick out of this, is that he's not afraid to tell you what you need to be told, whether you like it or not. He's going to tell it to you, but he's not doing it from a place of meanness mm -hmm. because he genuinely cares about me like a brother. So I accept that feedback and I'm able to give him the same feedback. So you just need to have friends in your life that are willing to tell you how it is and you either can accept it or you can get butt hurt, butt hurt over it. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, uh, it's only going to make you better. So that critical feedback, you know, it's just like if you were in a performance review with your boss, right? You may not want to hear it, but he's probably telling you some stuff you need to work on so that you can make that next promotion or get that next pay raise. So, right. So just take it in, suck it up, you know, tuck your tail between your legs and go work harder. Right. And that's just it. We have to work harder. Um, you know, there's, and I say it too, but it's kind of cliche is that, you know, 1% better every day. Yeah. Now, it may not be 1% better every day, but as long as you're moving in the right direction. Um, but we have to do that. If not, you're going to get stagnant and then you're going to start feeling sorry for yourself. And, you know, why is Matt, you know, killing a 200 inch deer on public land and I can't even buy a 140, you know? So it's just like, you kind of kind of put all that stuff aside and just focus on yourself and, and, and do the best you can. And that's all that we really want, right? Is we want to do the best we can because we all have different circumstances. We're all hunting in different types of, you know, places, you know, some people that hunt out East in Maryland, you know, they're probably hunting 115s and 120s as their, their megas out there because that's all they have to hunt, right? So you got to go after the biggest class animal that you have in your area. You know, where I'm in Kentucky, I, I have a good chance of scoring on a 140 or a 150 fairly consistently. So, but yeah, you have that critical thinking or not the critical thinking, but receiving the critical feedback is a huge component to what we're talking about in that discipline piece. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, um, I guess you probably just walk out to the woods in October. That's probably when you start doing all your work and, and then just go try to find a spot that looks good and jump up in it. Um, I'm being, I'm being funny about yeah. it. Yeah. So what is, what does discipline look like on a bigger scale for you when it comes to deer hunting, like throughout your year. Um, can you give Absolutely. us like a, an overview of what that looks like? Sure. So I always have a goal every year um, to broaden my horizons when it comes to new pieces, right? So I always want to add more areas to my Onyx and to, you know, yeah. the, the Rolodex of areas because you never know from year to year how one of your prime areas might not be so prime the next year. Maybe they came in and logged it. Maybe it's just your honey hole is no longer a honey hole because everybody knows about it. I've had that happen to me in a couple of my spots. Um, but I always try to add a couple areas to my arsenal every year. And I usually do that 
between January and March. So it's a great time to get out because you can see all the sign that the deer laid down from the previous fall and you can still see the hunter sign. And I think that's just as important, if not more important to me is to identify spots where it doesn't look like there's been many, many hunters, you know, I hate to say it, but there's a lot of hunters out there that leave their trash behind. Yeah. Um, they, uh, they leave their scent wicks hanging on tree limbs, you know, um, or you can easily identify trees that have climber marks or where, you know, climbing sticks have been put trail cameras is another giveaway. Um, so I try to pick them apart from a deer sign perspective and a hunter sign perspective. And that's kind of what I'm doing March or January through March. But then when we kind of progress into Turkey season, um, into the summer, then I, I'm not as apt to scout as much mm -hmm. like boots on the ground, just because one, I'm highly allergic to poison Ivy. I actually spent three days in the hospital one year because I got it so bad. Yeah. So, um, so I, I really just would prefer to like work on, you know, shooting my bow in the evening and spending time. Uh, I think you said it, you know, kind of building back up your, your capital with your family, right? Yes. Getting that good quality family time in, uh, doing all the honeydew projects, you yep. know, all those types of things. And then, you know, I'll also run trail cameras, but I will say this, and I hope people take, if they don't take anything from this conversation today, please take this to heart. Trail cameras are a great tool to help build your confidence. Like we were talking about, because confidence builds, mm -hmm. breeds success, right? Build your confidence that there is the type of deer you're after in the area that you're hunting. But trail cameras should not be the end all be all of your strategy. Because I know way too many hunters that rely on their cell cams to tell them when a deer is moving through the area. But we all know this, right? That one, when it's, you get a picture of it on your cell cam, kind of kind of going back to that instant gratification comment, like, oh my God, there's a, you know, a 170 right by my tree stand. Well, he's not going to be there when you go back. Mm -hmm. Now he might replicate that based on whatever the conditions were when he moved through. And that's a valuable tool, right? Mm -hmm. What was the wind that day? What was the temperature? You know, all those variables that can come, kind of come into play. But at the end of the day, trail cameras are a tool, but they're not the end all be all. So, all right, I went on a tangent there, so I'm going to back up. So, but I do run trail cameras because it helps me identify areas that are likely going to have deer that I'm willing to chase come fall. But really where my strategy is paid off for me, and it kind of goes back to the instant gratification comment, is that scouting and the information that I'm getting, and we'll just use 2023 as an example, in 2023, is setting the stage for me to be successful in 2024. I'm really looking a year or two in advance for what I'm going to accomplish. Now, granted, you know, so if you think about what I said from 2014 to now, I've been really successful, but that really started in 2012 when I moved back to Kentucky and I started learning more areas running trail cameras and started kind of doing that overlay of, okay, I'm going to leave this camera soaking in this spot that I probably am not going to hunt. I'm going to put it up in August and I'll come pull it in January and we'll see what was on it. And then this has happened to me several times in the last couple of years where buck parades coming through. And what I'll do is I'll note down the dates, right? Okay. Cold front. That was October 18th. I saw three mature bucks on their feet during a cold front in October 18th. They're starting to expand their range. All right. So this might be a good spot if I have a cold front in that same time period next year. Um, or a rut, right? You set your camera up in what you think might be a rut funnel. Um, and my definition of a rut funnel is just where, because I like I said, I hunt big woods, hill country. A rut funnel for me might be where three different types of uh uh terrain and uh, edge cover comes together. Um, you saw the video I just did the other day, yeah. and that's one of my favorite spots to hunt on public land because it really brings so many elements together. It's uh, terrain is kind of sloping down towards a creek, but then it flattens out along the creek and there's a big kind of draw or ravine that kind of pinches them up where they have to come around that, that ravine. 
and there's a big primary sc scrape right when they come around that ravine and then right past that scrape is there are a ton of red oaks and these red oaks are you know getting tore up so i've killed several deer in that spot because i know that they're going to come through there but why do i know they're going to come through there because i had a camera soaking there the year before giving me all that intel and when i pulled that card i was like a kid at christmas i was like oh my god this spot's going to be killer and the next year um i went in there and killed a nice uh, i think it was like 125 inch eight point you know being public land i was tickled to death to shoot that deer so those are the types of things that i'm doing you know now and throughout the year to set my success myself up for success in the next year and to your point we go out and we're hunting this year to kill this year, yeah. but we want to be doing stuff to prepare us for that. Cause like, I don't want to be the one trick pony. They're like, okay, I killed that deer. Now what? Mm -hmm. so yeah. It's all about, you know, being diversified, having cameras in different types of situations and being, and this is one thing that I had to force myself to do. Cause I didn't do it for a long time. And I think as you get older and more mature, you're able to kind of slow down and rationalize and really figure out what it is you need to do to be successful. And that is I never used to be comfortable with like going hunting in an area that had a type of terrain or, you know, a clear cut or whatever it is that I hadn't really hunted before, because I was like, I don't really know that. I don't want to take time to learn it. But now I almost would rather go throw a sit at that. Um, and learn from my failures and mistakes. And maybe I'm seeing deer moving, you know, 150, 200 yards away on the other side of the clear cut. Um, but then I realize I go over there and like, oh, they're using this because they're coming up over the the head of a draw, you know, and it's it's funneling them around this spot, but they don't want to come out in the clear cut. So they're just hugging the edge and going around and then going back to wherever they're going. So all these types of little things that I have really taught myself in the last several years has really led to um, my success um, as a hunter. And, you know, and I'm just an average Joe. I'm, you know, I'm a nobody that is somebody right is somebody, so I just, yeah yeah you know i mean i just and i love i love the sport i love to share the sport like you brought up you know that i love to get uh, on instagram and and just try to teach people what i'm seeing and what i'm doing and if one person picks up on that and that's it i you know i accomplished my 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 job yeah. as you know being a you know a trainer mentor so but yeah that's, so that's kind of what i do throughout the year to set myself up um to be in an advantageous spot come you know prime time because i'm i'm like you man i don't get a chance to hunt you know every day and you know mm -hmm. I, I really envy because i love the outdoors i envy the folks that can get out there and hunt you know 90 days a year that's just not that's not realistic for me so i probably on a good year will hunt you know and it depends on my success rate, right? So if I if I'm successful early, then you know, in twenty we can talk about 2022. 2022 was the best year I've ever had. Um, and uh, but on an average, I probably spend maybe 20 to 25 days if I'm lucky yeah. um in the in the woods a year. So you want to do everything you can to to make those days count, right? So yeah. So we'll definitely get to 2022. Um so what I want to go back to the trail camp thing for a second because i think that is a trail cams create that instant gratification and what i see and i'm going to be judgmental for a second okay guys so and i'm gonna be judgmental because i did this anything that i if you hear me being judgmental i hope it's always something that i did and i realized the mistake that i made i used to get pictures of huge bucks before i killed bucks and i would post them or show people them and it gave me a feeling of accomplishment. Yep. And in the end, if my goal is to kill a, a, a certain quality of deer, right? Inches or, or maturity, whatever it is, um, having a picture of that deer didn't do anything for me. Now, you're right. You can I use it as a tool for data to kill an animal. Here's my thing. If you haven't been successful putting deer down yet and you're getting pictures of deer, do not post them for a simple discipline of delayed gratification. Because once you post it, I actually think the likelihood of someone to go and, 
and do the work to fulfill that, I, I, if they if they haven't built that system in their life yet, it's actually going to be a roadblock. You're going to think that you did something and you did nothing. It's a lot of times, I've read a couple of books when people say like, if you have plans to do something, a goal, don't share it with anybody because your brain actually fools itself. You get a dopamine hit by saying, hey, I'm going to go get in really good shape, which I am talking about that because that's something I want to, <laughs> I want, but, but you yeah. know, what it does is it creates this dopamine hit and it, and people, oh, that's awesome. I'm really glad that you're doing that. Or, oh, hey, I'm going to start a new business. Oh, that's awesome. That's so cool, man. I can't wait. You know, and so you're getting this instant, you're getting this gratification, this, this feeling of accomplishment and you've done nothing. A picture of a buck is nothing if that, if your goal is to kill it. So Deny yeah. yourself that that gratification. Don't post it. Go kill it, and then post it with you holding those horns. Let me tell you, that's a way better feeling than posting. Well, and those there's horns. another reason you don't want to post the pictures because <laughs> yeah. if you're hunting public land, I'm telling you, you you go through my Instagram feed. It's been a long time since, and if I put a trail camera picture up, it was probably like from a season prior yeah. into your yeah but to your point yeah don't put the cart before the horse right yeah. you haven't you haven't won the chess match yet but it's cool to see the pictures you're right and i will tell you what i've got some megas that i've gotten on trail camera over the years on public land um that just would absolutely keep you up at night right yeah. and um it's crazy when you see those deer being held by somebody else right and they're doing yeah. the grip and grin um, and that's happened to me on two different big deer on the public land uh, place that I hunt. You know, it's kind of the cool thing about the social media aspect is you can reach out to them, DM yeah. them and be like, hey, and then you can share the pictures with them. And they, what's, it's sad because they didn't have a clue that deer existed, right? And they got the opportunity. And I had like, this one was 186 inch non-typical. I had three years of history with them. And I was slowly closing the noose on them, but I don't think I was aggressive enough on this deer and you know talk about lessons learned you know and being critical of yourself you know i kicked myself i was like i knew where he lived but he was in a hard to get spot and, and thermals and wind was really you know a challenge to, to master in this area where this buck was living and that's why he was living there so but um but yeah that de that deer you know was a a buck of a lifetime, but the guy was super thankful that, you know, I shared the pictures with them and kind of shared the stories with them. But yeah, you don't want to put the car before the horse. You don't want to feel like you've won the game before you've won the game, right? You see that in sports all the time. People celebrate prematurely and then all of a sudden the tides turn and they're like, oh my God, I just lost the game. Oh yeah. So, yeah. That's yeah. a great, that's a great tip. Yeah. The other thing I saw too was your, I think um, a cautionary thing about trail cameras. Now, I believe in them, by the way. This is an anti- 100%. I'm this not is, an anti-trail no, camera guy. At all. Either am I'm I just saying, all. you know, it's like buyer beware. Just be be realistic with your expectations of the tool. It's a tool, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's a tool we use to get an advantage on a deer. But if you're waiting, and I got two really good buddies of mine um, that they're like bona fide big buck killers. One two years ago, killed a giant, um, opening week of Kentucky, uh, 186 inch, uh, velvet, non-typical. And then another buddy of ours a year before that killed a 190 something, uh, during the rut, you know, and just they're big buck killers, but they live and die by their trail cameras. And I just like, man, it, it's the time is right. It's the right time of year. The weather's right. Screw. How many times have we sat in our tree stands where a trail camera is sitting and watched a, a parade of deer come by us and not one of them walked in front of that camera. Yeah. You know, it happens to us all the time. It happened to me uh, in the place I hunt in Indiana this year. I saw 12 deer in one sit um, and it was in a rut funnel during um, it was early November and not one of those deer walked in front of my cell camera. Yeah. And if I hadn't been there, I would have thought, Oh, that spot was skunked. You know, I'm glad I didn't hunt there, but. I went in there anyway. And that's a lesson, right? You got to take those lessons and apply it to other spots that you hunt. Yeah. And your in your technique of letting cameras soak and then using that information for next year. The way I look at it is if you're using and and I think you can use camera data in the moment. I mean, I know plenty of absolute killers that do it. I mean, you can listen to the podcast, they're yep. out there. Jake Bush is one of them, you know. Yep. Um uh BG Bowhunter, I um uh, Josh Prophet, he's someone who who uses yep. cam cameras that way, but they also soak. They also use them for next year. 
But um, so you could definitely can do it. But for most of us, because we haven't like refined that skill fully, it's a reactive action you're doing. You, if you if you're letting the cameras chase you, like move you around, you're being reactive. Where if you let them soak and use them for next year, you're being proactive. And if you're proactive, you can get up on them before they even know you're there. Like hundred percent. You're setting up your odds for success. And the word that came to mind for me when you were talking was consistency. Yeah, you can use a, you can use your camera to kill a buck now, or you can use them to invest in your future and have consistency, which you have had year after year after year. So what do you want? Do yeah. you want that instant gratification, that that one trick time that you get the buck and oh, there I am. But for the next five years, I don't have a buck. Or do you want yep. to kill you want to kill a buck every five, you know, every year for five years? Right. Yeah. And it's kind of goes back to the statement that you can pay now or you can pay later, but you're going to pay. Right. So I would rather pay now. And to your point, the consistency, the discipline, you know, just focusing on the small details. I'd rather do that now, one, because I enjoy it and it's kind of part of my persona and who I am now. Um so that I can reap the benefits later. Because if I don't do it now, let's be, you know, fair. Luck pays a huge part of what we do in the yeah. outdoors, right? People kill guys that have been hunting a, a year or two will go out and kill absolute hammers, bigger deer than I've ever killed. Um, but then they don't mm -hmm. realize what they did to make that happen. And then they go into the next, you know, 10 years and they never can replicate that because they had no clue what they were doing. So um what we do today, tomorrow, and the next day, absolutely 100% translates to what we're going to be doing a year from now. And that goes yeah. back to that consistency in the physical aspect, yeah. you know, um, which I believe pays, plays a huge part of my success, um, not just in the woods, but, you know, just in life and in life, work yeah. and all that. So, yeah. yeah. So um, 2022... Because guys are going to be listening to this, going, "Okay, we hear you." Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, all right. We'll be we'll be disciplined. But um, 2022 was an extraordinary year for you. Yes, 2022 is a year that I highly doubt I will. I mean, we all say that we say it, hoping that we're going to prove yeah. ourselves wrong, right? Oh, I'll yeah. never be able to do that again. But we're like, man, I really may never be able to do that again. Um, but yeah, 2022 was just a phenomenal year for me and it really kicked off. It was a poor early season, you know, here in Kentucky, we get to start hunting uh, Labor Day weekend, right? So we get to hunt velvet deer and I always try to get out and chase some velvet deer. Um, now I don't usually do very well on velvet deer on my public spots, but I have this really nice little honey hole urban spot right outside of Louisville that I've hunted and I've had some success over in the years. But so it was really kind of, I got a slow start in 2022 and then a, a, a longtime army buddy of mine who lives out in South Dakota, who's been hunting uh, the mountains of Montana, you know, his whole life has been begging me to come out there and chase elk with them. But I've always just like, ah, yeah. And finally I was like, dude, I'm coming. So we went out, um, I got drawn for a Montana, uh, general, uh, bull tag. Um, but we couldn't make it work where I could go out there and chase him with a bow, which I would have preferred to done, but he already had committed to somebody else to go hunt Idaho. So I said, all right, we'll just, we'll link up and we'll hunt uh, the opening of the elk rifle season and went out there and had a phenomenal time. Never elk hunted a day in my life. And on day four um, of a six day hunt, um, I was able to capitalize on a nice uh, five by five satellite bull. It might as well have been a 350, right? I mean, yeah. it's just, it was just one of those things. And it, what was cool about it was um, I met a guy in camp that my buddy had met through elk hunting out in this uh, this area. Um, they became really good friends. And his buddies had headed back to Wisconsin and he stuck behind and he's like, hey, you mind if I just go hunting with you guys today? And we're like, yeah, come on. Um, so he was actually right next to me when um, well, we were driving and actually spotted this uh, herd of elk. And uh, ended up pulling over and it was uh, in a, I can't remember what they call it out there, but it's basically where ranchers own the land, but they lease it back to the state yep. um, and you have to like sign into the area, but you can hunt it. Right. So, um, so we we're on Onyx trying to figure out where the sign in boxes. We see this, you know, we all see these other hunters coming from another direction. So it was like a mad dash to the sign in box to get our little ticket to get over the fence to hunt. But um, 
going back to being in shape, right? I luckily for me and unluckily for my buddy, uh, Robert from Wisconsin mm -hmm. was hoofing it three quarters of a mile across basically this, uh, prairie land over this steep ridge to get up where they were in this bowl on the other side. And got up there and he finally got up next to me, called the range out and I was able to kill my first elk. So that's what started 2022. So I'm coming back from Montana with, you know, a couple of freezers full of fresh uh, elk venison. So um, I get back, spend a couple of days um, with uh, my wife. And then uh, it was rut time, right? Because now we're at November 1st. So I uh, got out and this is where um, we talk about doing things today or this year to prepare you for next year. I went to a spot that I had never hunted before. And a buddy of mine who hunts similar to me, who's been running trail cameras in this general area for a couple of years, um, couldn't hunt. And he was like, Hey, he's like, I'm going to put you on a spot. And this is not a spot I found, but it's through the same tech you know, technique. right? Yeah. So that's why it's relevant. So I want to put you in a spot where I know you're going to see some deer. Um, so first sit, go in there in the dark, you know, climb up uh, in the trees close to close by where he sent me the pin. And uh, it was November 7th. And um, it was um, obviously, you know, prime time during the rut. And I, uh, right after first light, I saw a mega, probably 160 type inch deer, coming up out of this uh ravine but he was on a beeline i couldn't grunt him i couldn't rattle him he was just like he was going somewhere and it didn't matter what he heard he was not he was not making his way up so i was like man that's a bummer but maybe he'll come back around so maybe like an hour later i did another rattling sequence and here comes this beautiful tall wide um eight pointer and i thought he had a drop time at the time but after i shot him and got up to him and recovered him. He had broke one of his tines off in velvet and it was the time to just drop down. So it wasn't a legitimate drop time, but I was nonetheless, I was tickled to death. So, so first sit, um, in November deer on the ground. I was like, okay. I was like, this is pretty good. I killed an elk now and I've killed, you know, a deer. Uh, and I, and I, and people are going to be like, okay, he hunts in Kentucky, he killed a deer, he's now done. So I guess I need to explain how I can kill multiple deer in Kentucky before people are like, man, Matt's got poachers on his show. What the <laughs> heck's going on? So, um, so in Kentucky, yes, it's a one buck state. So I have a state tag. And then the public land that I hunt is a wildlife management area that provides you buck tags in addition to the state limit. So I can kill a buck with my state tag i can kill two bucks on this wildlife management area and then i apply every year for a special unit tag that's good for only one week um and then uh, if i get drawn for that i can hunt a buck in what they call a doe only area i get to hunt a buck in a doe only area for one week and then if i don't fill that tag the tag's null and void it's no good mm -hmm. after that so I can kill technically if I get drawn for that four bucks in Kentucky, which is nice. So what I'm telling people is if you live in states like Kentucky that are one buck state and you would love to hunt deer, seek out these opportunities. They're there. You just have to go out and do your research and find them. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I killed that buck. Fast forward to November 9th. I go to the spot that we were just talking about earlier where I did the video when I'm talking about the primary scrape and the train sloping down and the creek running so I went to that spot on the ninth. So we're talking uh, two days later. Same thing, first sit of the year. Very important, guys. I'm telling you, first sits are the best sits, especially when you're hunting, you know, mature age class deer. Because as soon as you walk in there and lay your, your ground scent, no matter how you know good you think you are at scent control, those deer know you're there. So the first sit's always the best sit. And the good thing about this spot. Um, was that this creek provides a strong thermal pool. So I can basically hunt it on two different winds because the creek's going to correct my wind for me and pull it down to the creek. So I hunt on the creek side, it sucks my wind down. It's just one of those confident spots, right? But it's not a confident spot if you haven't done your homework. Yeah, that's you know, right. Exactly. So, you know, having trail camera knowledge and all of that. So I go in there, same thing, uh, an hour and a half into the hunt, 
burst rattling sequence. I pull this 120 inch, another eight point comes in as shoe, shoestring. I shoot it. So boom, two sits, two bucks down. Both came into rattling and both were on first sits. So, you know, there's some, some takeaways here. So then I moved over to Indiana to the place that I hunt in Southern Indiana. I know you like to hunt Indiana yeah. a lot too, So, but we're hunting completely different ends yeah. of the state. You need to come south. <laughs> I know I do. I know I do. It's just an easy <laughs> hop. It's an easy hop over the yeah, border. For you, me, it's but... an easy hop. Yeah. yeah. We can talk more offline. I'll give you some tips. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I move over to Indiana and it was opening day of the um, rifle season. And uh, it's it's been, it was my first year hunting this spot. So I didn't have a whole bunch of knowledge of this spot. So I didn't get to do what we're talking about, you know, doing my prep work the year before to give me confidence for this year, but my knowledge of terrain, you know, and that's another benefit of being in the military for 24 years, you yeah. know, we eat, breathe and sleep, uh, you know, land navigation and train management and all that stuff. So, and knowing how deer use the topography, um, and the fact that this one particular buck that I was after, I had two bucks in mind. Uh, one was called numero uno, just because he was my number one target uh, buck. And then the other one was this just gnarly crab clawed uh, brow time, uh, almost 100. He ended up scoring 149 inches. I thought he'd go over 150, but he was narrow. So I think his width is what hurt him a little bit. But he left a distinct rub on these cedar trees because of the way his brow time was. And I was like, this has got to be that, you know, turkey foot brow time buck um and he was laying it basically paralleling an old logging road and um so i decided on opening day of rifle season that i was going to drop down to the bottom of this draw and climb up on my climber as, as high as i could get and face back towards the cedar thicket because the wind was in my favor um and it was one, it was one of the best hunting days i've ever had when it comes to weather because we had a snowstorm come in and anybody that hunted indiana in 2022 on opening weekend of rifle knows exactly what i'm talking about it was just beautiful um actually i think there's some video clips of it on my instagram but i was sitting there and i'd seen all kinds of deer movement all morning nice up and comer bucks two and a half year old bucks young bucks does i think i saw maybe 9 or 10 deer and um, it was probably about 11, 11, 15, and the, the action had died off. And um, my buddy, Aaron, who I was talking about, my best friend, his brother texted me and was just asking me like, hey, what's going on? How are things going? And I was kind of relaying to him how my hunt was going. I was like, yeah, I'm just not seeing the deer that I'm after. And he said to me, he's like, oh, man, I got confidence in you. You're, you're, a, you're a killer. You're going to kill something. And this is no lie, Matt. As soon as he texted and I read it, I look up and I see a big body deer and I'm like, I'm cursing myself. It's like, man, put your phone away. And I see him going into the cedar thicket and I'm like, crap. Like if I had been sitting there observing, I would have had my shot. Right. So I'm like, so I put my phone back on my vinyl harness and he went into the cedar thicket. And this goes back to, um, you know, three, third time to charm with the rat and the antlers. I reached down, grabbed my antlers and just literally five seconds. And I barely tickled them just like, a, you know, bucks were just kind of just feeling each other out. And I set him down. And as soon as I set him down and looked up, he had stepped back out of the cedar thicket. And uh, he was about 90 yards away. Um, and I was hunting private ground. So you can hunt rifle now in Indiana as long as you're hunting on private ground. But I was hunting with my uh, my shotgun, my 220, my Savage 220, 20 gauge. And uh, he stepped out and showed me that front shoulder. And uh, so actually, this was my fourth hunt, third buck, fourth hunt, because I had a hunt in between when I killed that second deer and this deer. So three, three deer and four hunts, all first sits, all based off of, except for this one, I didn't have historical knowledge from years past, but I did have knowledge of deer, the yeah. caliber of deer I wanted in the area. Um, and he ended up scoring 149. And then um, my son, who doesn't live with me, he's he was 15 at the time, was coming in to spend a couple of weeks with me during hunting season. And uh, so I knew I was going to shift focuses to uh, Gavin getting his, um, you know, kind of get into his season. So I took him out. We hunted um, a bunch. 
he never saw a buck that he wanted to shoot. Um, he did end up killing a doe, which, you know, I, I, we talk, you talk about on your show all the time. If you haven't killed a lot of deer, yes. kill, you know, kill deer yes. because you got to kill deer. Cause if you're waiting for like this majestic 160 inch 10 point to walk out, and that's the first deer you ever shoot at. Good luck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> May the force be with you. Yep. So, um, so he killed that doe and man, he's a crack shot. I thought I was a good shot. Um, he shot that deer offhand at like 60 yards with the same 220. Um, and we got her and then, um, the rifle season went back out again. So I went back to hunting and we talked about that extra bonus tag that you get in the doe only area. Well, I was lucky enough to draw one of those and my, my hunt started on November 30th and it ran for five days. So I had five days to get it done. But this goes back to that historical knowledge, pay now, pay later mindset. And I had hunted this area. This was actually the first area I hunted way back in the mid nineties when I hunted this place, um, when I was still in the army and killed my first deer on this, uh, place. It was a doe. So I had been hunting this place for years, but it had been a long time since I'd been in there. But when I moved back to Kentucky in 2020, 12, I started kind of going back to that area. It's a doe only area, but it's a cool area to go. If you only have a short amount of time, you know, it's an, it's an easy hunt from the aspect. You don't have to walk very far from your parking spot. So I had intimate knowledge of this area and i had killed a deer previous in this area and in that season previous than when i killed this other deer i was noticing a trend with the way the deer were using the terrain and they were funneling past this certain spot it was just kind of like a little knoll and they would just kind of dip around this knoll and i was noticing it but the year previous I had killed my deer and I was done in that area. So I kept a mental note of that. So the next year in 2022, I was like, I'm going to set up, or I'm going to, I went in and scouted it a couple of weeks prior um, just to kind of see where scrapes were and, you know, historical rut sign. And I found a couple primary scrapes all within 50 yards of this little knoll. So I was like, all right, so it kind of, it, made me know that what I was thinking was the reality that deer were using this area. So I went in there on opening morning and I'd been getting, I had a couple trail cameras set up in there. So I knew that there was 135 inch nine point that I would be willing to harvest in there. And there was a couple other scrub, like 115 to 125 inch eights that were in there that meh, it was a bonus tag, right? So they may have, they may have took a ride home in the truck if they had shown themselves. Well, when I was walking in that morning, I had my red headlamp on and I saw two eyes looking at me and get up and not book, but just get up and like kind of trot off. And it ran right by where I, my trail camera was and it was a cell cam. So I was like, please don't be that 135 <laughs> inch deer. Right. And so I get up, get set up and get my stand up and I pull out my phone and look. Sure enough, it was that 135 inch deer. And I'm like, son of a biscuit, this my hunt's over. Right. Yeah. But I only have a limited amount of time. So I'm like, well, I'm going to make the best of it. I'm here. I'm going to hunt. It was a really cold, windy day. I was getting blasted by the wind because I was getting hit basically right in the face. And what's funny is a couple of days prior in a group text chat with my buddies, I was kind of being a smart ass, but I was like, I'm going to call my shot. I'm going to be done by 9 a.m. on opening on my first day in this area. Right. Well, when that 135 ran off from me when I was walking in, I was like, oh, that's probably not going to pay yeah. off. <laughs> well, at 855, I decided, even though the rut's pretty much over, um, this is a doe only area. And the doe only area is because they have a high population of does and they want these does taken out to keep them from running across roads and in traffic and things like that. So I was like, well, if it's got a high population of does, there's a good chance that does are still not bred. Deer might still be competing for um, the last remaining does that need to be bred. So I'm just going to do a, you know, a rattling sequence. It's not going to hurt. So I crack the horns together, do about a 45 second um, rattling sequence, hang them up, lean. I'm standing, I'm a stander in my stand most of the time. So I was standing in my, um, I was hunting out of my lone wolf uh, custom gear 1.0. And I was leaning up against a tree and I had this squirrel that had been harassing me all morning. So I like, I hear something coming over my left shoulder 
And I'm thinking it's this dang squirrel. So I didn't pay any mind, right? But then it gets a little bit closer and I finally decide to look and I look over my left shoulder and it's a mega. I mean, oh. just 10 point heavy. And he's like just stiff legging and he's coming and he's already at like 24 yards. So I'm like grabbing my bow and I had my, I use a, um, a, uh, spot hog, uh, fast Eddie, um, yep. you know, slider and the scrape that I was hunting where I thought I might see the deer was 37 yards. So I had my pin set on 37 yards because I was like, that's where my shot is. I know it, you know, kind of calling your shot type thing. So this all happened so fast. I knew I didn't have time to dial down, but I knew that he was going to be. So I was like, I told myself, aim low, aim low. So finally he quarters away from me at about 19 yards. And I aim what I thought was low enough, um, but I spined him. So he went down at mm -hmm. 19 yards right in front of me and uh, ended up shooting my biggest public land buck to date. And he scored exactly 160. Oh my Ten gosh. Point. As a matter of fact, that's him right there. Oh, that's awesome, man. Yeah. He uh yeah, so he um he was my third buck in basically six archery dedicated sits. First hunt based off historical knowledge, you know, and just and the rattling. So all three of my deer were killed from rattling first sits. And then basically, because I paid yeah. then to benefit later. And that's kind of goes back to, um, you know, just confidence breeds success. And you don't get confidence from, you know, not focusing on your craft and having that discipline. And then to really cap the season off, we were talking about my son. He was able to come back for the first uh, weekend of the late season muzzleloader in Kentucky. And a good buddy of mine. Um, who uh, deals and leases and, you know, helps other hunters out with uh, land to hunt in Kentucky. I reached out to him and I'm like, hey, Brandon, do you have any place that I could take Gavin just for a couple of days? He's going to be in town. He's like, yeah, I have this. It was about a hundred acre piece that nobody had leased out. He's like, it's all yours. Have at it. Um, so I ran out there on the morning. Uh, it was Thanksgiving morning. And, you know, Kentucky's a bait state and I'm not a big bait, a bait hunter. I'll mm -hmm. be the first to tell you if they baited ban, if they banned baiting in Kentucky, I would, I would not skip a beat because I hunt public land mostly and you can't bait on public land. Mm -hmm. So I went out there and put out three different corn piles in areas that I thought would be pretty good based off of map recon that I did. And I ended up starting getting pictures of a really nice, heavy bodied deer that I estimated to be like low one thirties. And then another deer with it that was like a 120 type deer. And uh, so um, I stayed out of there except to, you know, freshen up the bait pile and stuff. And opening day came and I took my son out there and we hunted the morning. It was super foggy and misty and we didn't see a single deer. So we got out of the uh, the stand, went and grabbed a, um, some breakfast and came back in. And that afternoon, that buck stepped out uh, and he got about a 90 yard shot with his muzzle loader. And ended up shooting 135 inch uh, <laughs> deer. So as a 15 year old, yeah, I mean he was, yeah, he was. Uh, so yeah, so three deer for his old man, one deer for him, and then the elk. And it just, and I really attribute it to, um, you know, some of it luck, obviously, but all the cards fell in my favor because on the days that I hunted, the conditions were right. I hunted on days where conditions were right. Um, I had the historical knowledge. I knew how deer use the terrain. So what I encourage hunters to do that may be struggling to your point that maybe they haven't really started killing their first 120s, 125s, 130s. And what can I do to do that? It's all about a, paying attention to the hunts that you are on now to figure out what, yep. like, because a lot of times I think what people you know, some of it's pure laziness. Like some guys I hear they're like, yeah, I hunted all day and I kept seeing deer going, yeah. you know, down and they, they didn't adjust. I'm like, well, why didn't you get, well, I just didn't want to make the noise and, you know, or it's just like, you got to make your own buck sometimes. So I think, and I say this to people a lot and they don't like to hear it, but it kind of goes back to the, like, sometimes you just gotta, you know, take it on the chin and realize, yeah, that applies to me. And that is we all 
get exactly what we deserve. Yes. If we set ourselves up for success, we are going to get what we deserve. Yep. If we were lazy and don't put any effort into whatever it is we're trying to pursue, we're going to get exactly what we deserve. Yeah. So I think it really boils down to, um, you know, don't get jealous or mad or upset that you're seeing all these guys on social media, you know, gripping and grinning with these giant deer. You got to ask yourself, what am I doing wrong? What is, what do I need to do to be like Matt or Tim or all these other, you know, big name folks that are out there? Cause let's be honest, right. We're, we're not going to do it day, you know, year in, year out, mm -hmm. but consistency you know, if you give me a three-year period. I guarantee you that in a three-year period, I'm going to shoot a deer or two that are going to be, you know, worthy of going to the taxidermist. Um, and you don't do that by sitting back um, and thinking, okay, I got this figured out. Because as soon as you think you got it figured out, your butt's going to get handed to you and you're going to be like, okay, well, I guess I didn't figure it out. Because let's, you mentioned Jake Bush earlier, right? And, um, you know, Jake Bush is a phenomenal outdoorsman his woodsmanship skills are on point, but the last couple of years he struggled, right? Because one, he's chasing a certain class deer, yeah. right? So if you're willing to put all your cards on the table for like a 170 or better, you're probably going to eat your tag a couple of years before you can make that happen. So I, my hat's off to guys like Jake mm -hmm. because a 150 comes by me and I'm after a 170. I, I'm going to tell you what that deer that you can see right over my shoulder right there. I shot that deer in 2020 and I was after a non-typical that I actually saw right before I killed this deer. Um, he was probably, he probably would have scored high one seventies, low one eighty, and he was still in velvet. Uh, he had this huge, like giant, like nine inch club just hanging off his main beam. And one side was just like a cactus. Right. And the other side was just gnarly. Um, and he was probably about 50 yards away at his closest, but he was behind a cedar tree and I couldn't get a shot at him. And he ended up turning and walking out of my life. Well, five seconds later, he stepped out at 30 yards broadside. I'm like, oh, this is a no brainer. So I ended up shooting that deer in 2020 and he scored just shy of 157. So I just can't, you know, I personally cannot pass on a 150 type deer in hopes of a booner. The guys that can, I mean, I, I, I applaud you because I just, I don't have the, we talk about discipline. I don't have the discipline to do that, but I'm self-aware of that. Yeah. There's levels of it for sure. Yeah. And that's what we're saying is like, you don't have to be a big buck killer. All right. Like I just, like if you're watching everybody on Instagram and stuff like that, and you're thinking, well, that's what I have to be in order to be successful. No, it's not. You determine what success is for you. I would, I would challenge you though. And saying that, you know, if you kill the same caliber of deer every single year, unless that is the the pinnacle of of caliber in your area that you will become a better person if you challenge yourself to move up that ladder right yeah. and like so but you don't have to be a Jake Bush you don't have to be a Tim Smoke you don't have you know you can be a white belt sensei and and kill 120s and be happy about it that's i mean that was kind of what i was doing for a long time and and now i'm starting to challenge myself to move up that ladder but it's about progression and that's what this conversation is all about it's all about progressing as i'm going to say it sounds like progressing as a deer hunter i i think i can tim we've never talked about this but i can get a vibe off of you i think it's really about progressing as a person Right. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, and, and that is, that is truly um, my desire for all the listeners is that not only do you become a, a, a great deer hunter and reach your goals and, and progress in your, in your development there, but you actually become a better version of whoever you are for everybody yeah. else that's around you. One thing you had said earlier was um, I took away like, because uh, time with your family is important. If we're going to go out in the woods, we better do the work and, and and be disciplined so that while we're out there, it's efficient and we get it done and we succeed. We succeed so our families feel good about, you know, the time away with us and we come back and we achieved our goals. So um, that's really important too. The other thing I want to say about luck, you mentioned it a couple of times. I, I do think luck is a part of deer hunting success because, I mean, it, let's just say you're a bed hunter. Well, that, you know, a buck has a couple of different beds. And 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 so you have to get a little bit lucky on which bed he's yep. going. But 
it's the work that you put in that creates that luck for you. So I don't know if luck in the way that we think of luck is actually the right word to use, but you create opportunity for things to happen by being disciplined, by putting in the work. That year in 2022, somebody can sit there and go, oh man, that how lucky is Tim to be able to do that? How lucky is Tim to have a friend who knows that spot to put him in that spot? Well, it's yep. none of that is luck. None of that is luck. Your friendships aren't luck. I mean, that guy cared enough about you because of the quality of person that you are to, to say, hey, man, I'm going to share some info that I have, some historical info that I have about this spot. All of yep. the work and all the spots that you, you you put in created opportunity, even if it was from you know years prior, all of that has to do with discipline and the work that you put in. It's not luck. And so if you're looking at yourself, we can easily look at other people and make so many excuses. I mean, we can, you know, I, I'm guilty of this. Like there was a phase in my life where I would look at the juries and go, well, they have pristine property, you know? Right. Okay. Well, okay. If that's the goal, if, if I'm looking at them and going, well, they're, they have this, well, what's stopping me from going out and having pristine property and doing all of that? Like they worked hard enough to do it. Why can't I work hard enough to do it? Well, I don't yeah. want that. Well, then stop bitching about that and set your goals and go after what you want to go after. Like, like yeah. pointing out all this other stuff about other people, it it does nothing for you. And so focus in, do the discipline and create opportunities for things to happen. Yeah. And this is not, hunting is not a team sport. You know, you got to equate hunting to sports like, you know, golf, tennis, bowling, whatever yeah. you're, you know, they're all individual sports. So um, even though like, to your point, and I, I freely give out that information that a buddy provided me with the intel to get that job done because I'm genuine and I don't want to take credit for something that, you know, that was not me like finding a spot me like this is the spot where I'm going to kill a deer. It's um, still, your, but, still your skills that killed that deer though. Sure. No, but yeah. the relationship aspect of our sport is huge because, you know, it really is a dying sport when you yeah. think about it. Right. And a lot of it has to do with social media and that's the downside of social media, but the upside of social media is like you and I yeah. connected over social media. Right. And we, um, there's a group that I'm a part of. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of it. It's the bow hunting league. And it's yeah. a, it's a group of, it's all archery hunters. Um, and it's basically a contest. And I know some people poo poo on contests, but this is a team driven aspect, right? So you have three hunters that team up together and the total number of inches of your harvest between the three of you um, go towards, you know, all these prizes that you can win. It's a free contest. But the thing about that group that's better than winning free stuff for killing deer that, you know, we're trying to do anyway is the relationships that come from it and the bonds that are formed and the networking that happens. Um, so. I say this to say, if you're struggling um, in improving, you know, the quality of deer that you're killing, don't be afraid to reach out to these guys that you're seeing on social media, because nine times out of 10, they want to help you. They want to share information. They may not tell you, you know, hey, hunt this spot like my buddy did with me, because that's a relationship we built over time. But what they are going to provide you with is you know, the, the recipes, the success that have helped them. And to your point, not everybody is going to hunt the same way. For instance, I'm not a bed hunter, right? We hear about mm -hmm. that all the time. Like you got to get close to the bed and, you know, but then you see studies from MSU to say yeah. deer has got like 27 beds and, you know, he may only use one of them twice in a 27 day period, you know, it's just like, yeah. so I'm like, I knew I was right, but you know, obviously people are killing deer off bed. So, um, it's all, you got to take everything mm -hmm. with a grain of salt. But um, if you can take little nuances or tidbits from multiple hunters and kind of mold your own kind of style um, that works for you, that's all you can do. And it goes back to that discipline and consistency. Um, you know, just like there's mornings where I do not want to get up to go work out. And my wife will tell you if she was down here right now, she'd be like, it's the funniest thing. There'll be some mornings my alarm goes off and she's not a morning person. And I'll be like, I really don't want to get up. And I will literally call myself names out loud. I'll be like, get up, pussy, or whatever. You know, <laughs> I, do the same my thing. I do the same <laughs> so, thing. You know, but it's that consistency thing because I know that if I get up and I go do my workout before I start my day, 
I'm just, I feel so much better about myself because mm-hmm. I got it done and I conquered the day. Right. So, you know, we, everybody hears Jocko say it all the time, you know, the 4am club, I'm not quite getting up at 4am, but it doesn't matter what time you're consistent as long as you're consistent. And I think people, I don't think people give it enough credit when um, we're talking about things like just personal dis- self-discipline uh, physical uh, health and fitness, mental health uh, and fitness, you know, guys, as guys, mm-hmm. we struggle a lot talking about our mental health. Um, but I don't struggle talking about my mental health because I've lost too many uh, military buddies to suicide because they mm-hmm. didn't want to talk about it. So I'm not going to be that guy. So all those things really play into our successes. So, you know, all the tactics and gear, you know, I'm a lone wolf custom gear guy, you know, and I will tell you that that is part of my success because I have confidence in my setup and my gear. I don't have, that's one less thing I have to worry about. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I can focus on what the thermals and the wind are doing or, you know, whatever. Um, so that's all important, but it's not as important as taking care of yourself and putting yourself in the right frame of mind to go out and get done what it is you want to get done. So, you know, yeah. working out for me is huge because it helps me sleep good at night, gives me clarity of thought, you know, it's just, there's so many positives that come from that. And I know people that are listening in that may not necessarily um, want to tackle that as a, a personal objective. Um, but I think if they hear it enough, you know, it may start sinking in. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. I want to talk on that for a little bit because, um, I'll share a little story about myself. It's that. So last year I scouted 200, probably 250 miles by this time, by this time last year, I had a hundred miles in. That's insane. Yeah. (laughs) And, and I felt great doing it. Like I'm, I'm 46 right now. So, um, I felt great doing it and I don't know how many miles I put in during the hunting season. Um, but in the year before that, it was probably around 150 miles of scouting. And I'm scouting a lot of times I'm scouting like ridge country. So I'm going up and down, up and down. And I felt really good doing it. Last January, um, I got an injury. So I pushed through that injury injury through uh, the season. I still scouted all those miles. And it started to get worse and worse and worse. And what happened was, if I'm going to be completely honest with myself and be critical, I stopped working out last January. And so I think the residual of, of the physical fitness that I had prior to the injury helped me get through that scouting season, yep. but I didn't do anything. And I've gained, I'm going to just lay it all out there. I've gained 20, 25 pounds of fat, pure fat. Um, I've got, I've got a big belly right now. And I had, I had for an old man, I had a four yeah. pack and I was cut. Like I, yeah. I don't think, I don't think I have the genetics for a full six pack, honestly. Cause I, I was down to about. 12% body fat. So I should have, you should have been almost be able to see a six. Yeah, that's pretty good. Time. And, and I was working out. Um, I worked for me working out six days a week is, is healthy for me. Like I can maintain it. It's all good. So what I'm saying though, is I, I, I made excuses with this injury and I, I got out of shape this year. I've been scouting. I am so far behind um, the eight ball on this. And I went scouting this weekend and I had to quit earlier. Like I usually scout from sun up to sundown and I had two hours of sun left and I didn't get it done. I didn't go as far as I normally go. I I didn't pay attention to the detail that I normally pay attention to. Like I couldn't actually see the sign. It was there. I know it was there because I talked to another individual who scouted it and he was showing me what he saw and we scouted the same exact area and I didn't see it. My mental clarity, my mental clarity wasn't there and it's all because I ignored my physical fitness. So if if you want to go out and, and killing bucks, whatever you define as a big buck, whatever your goal is, is important to you, I cannot stress enough that physical fitness is every bit as much as shooting your arrows, scouting, doing all of that stuff, because it is the foundation that's going to give you the energy, the mental clarity, all the things that you you need to do comes from your physical fitness. So the dojo is my, my shameless little plug. Um, on Instagram, on, on the dojo, I despite me being... I'm 20% body fat right now. Um, besides me being 20% body fat right now, I actually do know how to get in shape. I'm not saying I'm a guru in it, but I do know how to do it. And I actually am pretty good at making meal plans. And I'm just going to share all my information out there because one, uh, a little bit of, of I'm, 
a little self-shaming here. That's why I'm being honest. I'm putting it out there and I'm going to shame myself because that actually motivates myself. I think people need to self-shame a little bit more as long as your mental health is good. I agree with the mental health thing. Yeah. And then the, the other thing is um, because I do care about it. I want other people to to join in this journey. Um, I, I have a, um, a, a story uh, feed that, that you can go back to. I forgot what they call that. It's like a little circle on top of my my uh, grid and you can go yep. in there and see all of my recipes, my workout. I put my workout up there and um, I, I want people to share information. There's a hashtag. I think it's like, like uh, no gut kills big bucks or something <laughs> like that, that I'm sharing. I think I remember seeing that. Yeah. And, and so I just want to, and I'm doing it honestly because I need it for myself, but I do care enough for everybody else that uh, I, I hope you make this important. I hope you put some, some physical goal out there and reach for it. A hundred percent. And I think we owe it to our families, right? Even if you're a young single guy and you don't have a family yet, and I will be honest, if you're a young single guy, you might be working out because you're yeah. trying to attract the ladies, right? But once you get into a relationship, some, it's, sometimes it's easy to fall off the wagon, right? But we owe it to our families. Um, You know, I'm not a, ashamed to admit it. My dad's side, my dad died at 60 from a massive heart attack. And mm-hmm. so I'm 10 years away from when my dad, you know, mm-hmm. died. So that hits home for me and I'm way too young. I got way too much that I want to experience that I'm not ready to like call it a, you know, a life 10 years from now. So I'm doing everything in my power to make my life as meaningful and, you know, um, rewarding as possible. And that means staying on top of my physical health, right? And that means, you know, going to the doctor, yeah. getting a physical annual yeah. physical, right? A lot of guys don't want to go to the doctor unless something's wrong. And I'm telling you, especially us guys, as we get older, right, there's all kinds of things that can flare up if we don't get, you know, those annual checkups. So I know right now we sound like probably like a, a Dr. Phil <laughs> or something, but I mean, it's all true. And we older guys can speak from experience, you know, for, so for you younger guys, I think oh, I'm invincible. Like you guys are just full of it. Um, there's going to be a day where you're sitting in our shoes. Um, but if you just listen to a little bit of what we're telling you, you can really take advantage and, and start the routine and the consistency. Right. And, you know, the army helped me with that. Mm-hmm. Right. Who knows if I didn't join the army, if I would be as passionate about my personal health as I am now. Um, but you know, yeah, we're, we're, our lives are situationally dependent, you know, so whatever we're been exposed to is kind of what we're accustomed to. So, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to following along and, uh, because that's the part that I struggle with. I'm really good about getting in the gym, working out, you know, put myself through the paces, you know, making sure that I can wring my shirt out with sweat at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I'm not good at is my diet. I always joke with people. I was like, yeah, I work out so I can eat like a fat kid, you know, but, um, but that's not good either. Right. If you're, you know, eating copious amounts of bacon, you know, all that, you know, cholesterol is not good for your heart either. So, um, no, it's a huge, it's a huge part of the success that I find, um, you know, and my family appreciates it. Um, I'm able to keep up with my granddaughters now. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's, I can't, it can't, it can't be, it can't be stated enough how important it is to be a part of your overall program. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you don't believe it's just go look at every big buck public land killer out on Instagram. I mean, they're all in shape. Ryan Glitzky. Oh, he's know, a beast. Jake, yeah. Jake Bush. Um, oh man, just, there's a couple of names slipping my mind right now, but they, all these guys, you know, are just in phenomenal shape. And, and there's a reason for it. You know, it's just not luck yeah. that they're all, they're all built. I mean, they're doing it because, it helps them. Uh, it's the fuel for their passion. It helps them go and do what they want to do. Absolutely. I mean, and you know, you you hear the comments a lot of times in social media, like, "Oh, you don't have to be in shape to hunt white tails," and that could be true depending on your style, right? Mm-hmm. If you're hunting 200 yards from the truck and you can drive a side by side up to pull your deer out and yep. all that, yeah, you can be 350 pounds and can you know lose your breath opening up a little Debbie, but what's your quality of life really? Yeah. Like, right. So, but then you look at all these guys that are big, like out West hunters, like, yeah, I don't know if you ever follow like Dan Staten and elk shape. Oh yeah. Like that dude's a beast. Right. Yeah. But just like, I really can, or the Ken Hames, you know, and all that, they just like, they really eat, breathe and sleep that mindset that, you know, I got to do this for 11 months of the year. So for that 30 days that I'm out there chasing these, you know, mountain elk, 
um, that I don't have the one thing I don't have to worry about is if I can make it over that next ridge line. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a great mindset to have. Um, and that's really the mindset that I try to aspire to have. And like, I'm fallible. I'm not perfect. You know, there's times. It's not where, about perfection. Yeah. And that's just it. And I want the listeners to understand, like, when you hear us talking about being in shape, we're not necessarily talking about, you know, looking like Josh Bomar, right? Because mm -hmm. first of all, if that's your goal, good luck with that, right? That dude's yeah. another beast. I was just at the Iowa Deer Classic, um, it was a two weekends ago now. And I ran, I ran into Josh and Sarah because um, I was out there supporting Lone Wolf Custom Gear. And it was Sunday morning. That they hadn't opened the doors yet. So I was walking down the aisle and they were standing there looking at um, some blinds or something. So I just started chatting with them. And I don't know if you can tell this on his socials, but the dude's like six yeah. four and just like a built like a shit brick house, man. Yeah. And, just, and Sarah's, she's short, but she's built like two. But they're just, you know, but... Uh, the, my, I guess what my point is, is that that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is being better tomorrow than you are today. Yeah. So just as, you know, just like the workout methodology, you know, progressive overload, do a little bit more tomorrow than you did today, you know, and then when you hit your plateaus, take a week off and yeah. recover and then start pushing it again. It's not about like trying to be like the next Arnold Schwarzenegger no. competing classic because that's not realistic we're really i'm talking about functional fitness right mm -hmm. doing things that are going to help me out in the woods and that you know doing you know 100 box jumps may or may not be what it is i need to do that and you know being you know like you know having a barrel chest and you know a cut back it's not either but being able to have physical stamina like endurance right mm -hmm. so working on your cardiovascular system and things like that. So that's what I'm talking about. So I don't want Same. people to think, Oh, you know, they're, they're cramming like, you know, you yeah. know, the gun show and I'm going to look like I got my beach muscles popping on. It's got nothing to do with that. You know, even in my height of my physical fitness, nobody looked at me and thought, Oh, that dude's jacked. You know, I was lean. I had muscle. I could, yeah. you know, I could go the distance, but I didn't stand out in a crowd, you know, cause this wasn't my yeah. goal. My, my goal is to, have enough energy for my family my career and, and my passions, which was hunting. So yeah, I yeah. agree with you hundred percent. Hey, I'm well, getting... for some people. Oh yeah. I was gonna say for some people that might be their goal. Cause there's some guys in the industry that, you know, they really um, want to push their physique to that limit and that's okay mm -hmm. too. Always, um, yeah. Everybody's got their own like recipe for what um, works for them, but yeah. But yeah, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. I cut you off. No, it's good. Um, Really, this is this is. I, I, don't worry about cutting me off. I want you to talk. P people don't tune in for me; they tune in for for you guys. So, um, so it, we are getting to like the hour and a half mark. We're getting pretty close sure. to it, and I'm gonna bring up something that we actually didn't talk about that I hear you say over and over again, and that's family, and and family seems to be like really central for you, like. And I just want to kind of sit on that for a little bit and just kind of say like I, I appreciate that about you, and I appreciate hearing that and over and over and again. And one thing I worry about, because I it happened to me, I I invested myself into hunting so much that uh, in the early days when I was younger, it actually hurt my family. And so um, what we're talking about, really, I think, you know, we've been talking about self discipline. We're talking about delayed gratification. We talked about physical fitness. It all is about being a whole, like a com completely like a whole person that is is reaching the, the their best version of themselves and. Family, I think, is part of that. I think, in fact, it's it's central to that. And if if we go and we set all these goals and we do we kill these big bucks at the sacrifice of anything else, like our family or our health or whatever else it is, then it's it's really a, a defeating thing. It's it's not something that is, is life giving. And so I want to just encourage everybody right now. We've been talking about a lot of stuff, but take that you know kind of uh, we were talking about that self like critical self feedback. Look at those areas in your life. And, and if your family is it, life is hurting right now, if your career life is hurting right now, your, your, your health is hurting right now, maybe, maybe right now isn't the time to like dive into all of the hunting stuff that we're talking about. Maybe it's a time to step back and, and heal some of those relationships, lay the groundwork so that when you go and you hunt, you feel the true satisfaction of what you've done. You know, and I see that in you, Tim, really, I do. Um, there was a video that you you got two 
two mounts back and one was your son's and one was yours. And I noticed you talked more about your son's than, than you did in, in about yours in that one. And um, yeah, I just, that stood out to me and I really appreciate that about you. No, I appreciate that. And yeah, and, and to your point and, you know, and I'll be vulnerable for a second. Um, my first marriage ended in divorce and it wasn't all because of hunting, but back then I was a lot more of a s- selfish type mm-hmm. of person, right? I was also in the military. So the military played a big part of it as well. Um, but when I met um, my wife, uh, you know, I made a promise to her and myself that I wouldn't go down that road again. And, you know, I, another thing for the single guys out there that are listening to this, you know, find somebody that pushes you and encourages you um, and doesn't doubt you or like, you know, downplay what your goals and aspirations are too, but vice versa, you have to support theirs Mm -hmm. uh, in the same manner. And my wife is awesome. She, she says to me all the time, she's like, um, as long as I know I'm the priority, you can, you know, go yeah. hunt and do your thing. And, you know, she's not an outdoor person at all. So we don't share that. She doesn't even like to eat venison. So yeah, same, um, my wife, my yeah, so the same way. but, you know, but I support her and all the things she wants to do and, you know, and she does the same for me. So having that strong family nucleus is like kind of your center, like the gravity, right. Um, that's important to me. And, um, yeah, I, I love them to death and they allow me to do what I do. And they honestly, um, it just motivates me to yeah. really try to get the job done quicker so that I can come home and spend more time with them, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So family is important. Um, and, you know, that's kind of goes back to that mental um, and spiritual kind of yeah. wellness aspect. Right. Because if you have a, a, a strong support system, you feel emboldened to kind of do more. And, you know, because you hear about it all the time, people like they come from wrecked home lives and, you know, they just they circumstances that are above you know, and beyond what they can control and it really brings them down. So yeah, I, I got a great family. So I'm, I'm That's blessed. Awesome. That's yeah. awesome. The last thing I like to do in, uh, before we wrap up is to ask you is, was there anything that you wanted to like talk about or, or that we didn't get to today? Is there anything that, you know, not necessarily because, you know, we kind of agreed on what we wanted to hit home on. And that was the discipline aspect and, you know, taking care of yourself from a physical standpoint. Um, but for guys that are listening to this, that are maybe more like gear and tactics yeah. oriented um, or that are trying to really figure out um, what's going to work best for them, no matter where they hunt. I would just say that, you know, there's a lot of information out there because if you're like me, I love to listen to podcasts. You know, I drive for work a lot. So I'm on the road one day a week traveling all over Kentucky. So I listen to, you know, your podcast and various other podcasts. And a lot of times, you know, you hear somebody on a podcast talking about a method, whether it's, you know, hunting close to the beds or, you know, hunting the marshes or, um, you know, Jake Bush's kind of uh, thing, you know, hunting the, uh, the community scrapes down in the thermal hubs, you know, there's all these different tactics um, that um, can work, but uh, there's a lot more faults to them a lot of times than there Mm -hmm. are positives. So I would say to anybody that's trying to take their game to the next level, focus on the basics. Yes. yes. The kiss format, right? Mm -hmm. I've heard you say before, keep it simple, stupid is the more complicated you make things, the nuttier you're going to become trying to figure out like, what is it that I'm doing? So for me, I focus on like transition areas, um, diversity and cover terrain based movement, food sources. Like I said, I hunt big woods, hill country. So I'm not hunting ag, um, there are some food plots in some of the areas I hunt, but I avoid those like the plague because that's where <laughs> all the lazy hunters go. Yeah. So just focus on the basics. Woodsmanship, we've been hearing a lot of that lately, which I really appreciate on the Me podcast. Too. It's people really need to get away from just the e-scouting mm-hmm. and going and hunting without ever scouting it. Mm-hmm. Boots on the ground is always going to trump e-scouting. E-scouting will give you get you in the ballpark, no, without mm-hmm. a doubt. But um and if you hunt out of state, maybe that's all you have, right? And you're going to maybe have to uh, just relegate yourself to the fact that this is going to be a learning year for you. And then when you come back in year two, you're a prime example of that in Illinois, right? Mm-hmm. So just having um, expectation management, 
We talked about it earlier, using your trail cams as a tool, but not as an end-all be-all because those are going to fail you if you use them as an end-all be-all. And just remember that you're doing this because you enjoy it. It's not about your ego. It's not about, I need to kill a bigger buck than my buddy. Um, Because if if that's the kind of relationship with you have your buddies, they're really not your really good friends, right? Um, Yeah. So just focus on the basics. That's really, that's the best tip I could tell anyone, you know, it's just, if you start really overcomplicating things, it's going to not be fun for you. Yeah. I've had moments like that. We're all like that, right? Because we yep. want to kill that next bigger deer. And that would be a time, even during prime time, I've taken a couple of days to reset. I pull yeah. back because I'll come home and my wife would be like, how's your hunt? And I'd be like, rawr, rawr, rawr. and she'd yeah. be like, you yeah. know what? Stop being a baby. Like she, and, and it's, she's true because I say this at work a lot of times when things get stressful at work, I'll tell my, um, uh, my, my employees, I'm like, Hey, it could be worse. Uh, at least we're not getting shot at. Right. Because we used to say that in the army all the time yep. when you're on deployments, Hey, it could be worse. You know, we're not getting shot at. So, um, so just having that good mindset going into it, remembering it's fun and, and focus on the basics. Don't overcomplicate things. And I, I mean, if you do those things, you're going to kill deer, yeah. right? It's like, if yeah. you haven't killed a deer, Don't wait for that big, you know, 140 inch eight point, shoot that 110 inch six point that comes by you because now you're going to be that much more prepared for the next time a bigger one comes. So, yeah. So that if people could just do those things, they're going to, they're going to see their success go up. Oh, and it's the long game. Remember it's the long game. What you do today is going to, you know, guarantee, not guarantee, but increase your chances of success in the future. Nothing's yeah. a guarantee when it comes to hunting, unfortunately. <laughs> so true. So true. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I agree with everything you said. And I would love to have you back, um, you know, later on in the year for some tactical conversation because you are a guy of tactics. Like I've, I've listened to you talk and I'm, I've learned from you and uh, I would love to have you come back and we'll just talk tactics sometime if you're up for it. No, I love it. I'd come back anytime. And then maybe we, even during the season, we can do some in-season updates. Oh, and yeah. Just talk about what's working because... Uh, to your point, like that's when people are really listening to podcasts because they're really trying to hone their skills. They're like, all right, what do I need to do? You know, I love your series that you're doing, what you should be doing this month. So I'll yep. be listening into that. And uh, no, I just appreciate you. I appreciate the conversation. And hopefully uh, the listeners uh, got a little bit of something that they can add to their tool bag to uh, make them more successful. Yeah, for sure. For sure they did. And uh, yeah, so thanks, Tim, for uh, for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. And um We for sure will hook up in the future. Everybody else, thank you for coming out to the dojo today. We're going to be back next Thursday with another Whitetail Master, and uh, we look forward to it. Take care. Well, that is a wrap here on the Mobile Hunters Dojo. We're going to drop a new podcast every Thursday at 5 a.m. Do us a favor. Go give us a follow over at Instagram at the Mobile Hunters Dojo. Also, if you could leave us a five-star review at Spotify or Apple Podcasts, it helps us out a lot. Thanks a lot. We look forward to seeing you again back here at the Mobile Hunters Dojo.